thank you. And um, she is uh, coming, uh, she studied in Tennessee, in Knoxville, uh, in chem and did her studies on chemical physics. She, is then, she was then an R&D scientist and chem in chemical imaging team at the Center for Nanophase Materials and Sciences. And her, her passion is more or less relationship studies between physical structures and chemical functionality, something we are really looking into in multimodal imaging approaches. She moved on and uh, was a senior R&D scientist and a group leader for multimodal data analytics. And now she is at the Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, her work is innovative and highly appreciated. She received quite a number of awards like uh, and patents. And she was an early, she was awarded an early career award for her innovative combinations. And I do not want to take too much of your time, Olga. Uh, we are very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for the introduction and um, inviting me here to talk. It's actually very exciting to hear what you are doing as part of these um, Eurobioimaging and Camoles Consortium. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the work we're doing in developing correlated multimodal imaging technologies. Um, as the title of, of my talk is slightly different from the abstract, is I will focus mostly on some of the uh, unique work we're doing in developing, combining atomic force-based microscopy with mass spectrometry in collaboration with Oxford Instruments. But I'll also talk about some of the uh, kind of workflow developments, as Martina talked about, that we're developing for some other core of approaches where we're combining mass spectrometry with uh, functional characterization. So, sorry, my. Um, so why are we interested in developing imaging workflows? So really connecting chemistry to functionality requires the ability to perform both spatially and temporally resolved chemical analysis across um, lengths and time scales. And if you think about that, that's actually starting to generate, um, I don't know why my mouse is, um, why it's starting to generate data and imaging data, which is hyperspectral. And if you're starting to think, okay, if you wanted to understand um, all this imaging data, you have to develop a workflow that allows you to connect correlate the data, uh, extract physical relevant information. And if you start uh, developing these techniques, you start quickly understanding that the scale of the data uh, blows up quite rapidly. So you can no longer start processing some of this uh, data directly on your small uh, PC from your instrument on your home computer. You start have to incorporate larger computing schemes such as at Oak Ridge, we use high performance computing. And so we have the Summit system, which is one of the fastest uh, world supercomputers. Uh, to be able to really understand and develop new knowledge. And so a lot of the things that we do is not only we develop the physical hardware to develop these new imaging techniques, we also work on developing these workflows. Um, and the workflows include uh, correlative advanced image registration and reconstruction, and then multivariate and machine learning approaches for extracting physically relevant data. So what are we doing in terms of developing new technologies to really avail, uh, to enable us to visualize uh, this relationship, this functional imaging relationship of both local chemical and structural analysis? And so what we're interested in is how do we take a material and really visualize structurally and functionally what's happening with the material? And so this we can do with a, using an atomic force microscope. And uh, here you can see an AFM topography images of two polymer separates. You can see there's domains in there. But the ASM is really chemically blind. So if we want to start drawing uh, this uh, structure-function relationship, we want to be able to also probe this material chemically and see what's happening at the interfaces, because what you're seeing here is really only um, a visualization of the morphology. So we want to take an area of interest, we want to locate it, and then we want to be able to sample it chemically. And so how do we do that? So we can, we've actually been developing an approach using photothermal uh, desorption where we can use the AFM tip, the same AFM tip that we have scanned the surface with to get uh, both structural, mechanical, electrical properties. We can now heat up this, uh, this AFM tip and uh, under the AFM tip, we can now thermally desorb the material. We can extract the thermally desorbed material and then we can ionize it and transport it to the mass spec. And so once we have this information, now we have these two channels of information going on. We have both this AFM generated uh, structural information combined with the chemical information coming out of the mass spectrometer. 
And the beauty of this experiment is that you're using the exact same AFM probe to generate both the AFM morphology and the chemical analysis. So the data is inherently co-registered. And because you're using the AFM, you now have a very, very well-defined localized sampling area under the AFM tip that you can now have nanoscale characterization both with the AFM and nanoscale chemical imaging with mass specs. Now, what does that look like in principle? Uh, here's some data that we acquired using slightly different probes before we started working with Oxford, where instead of using uh, the laser light to basically uh, drive the photothermal desorption from the tip, you can also use resistive heating. And resistive heating, basically, you have a resistive element at the end of the AFM tip that allows you to heat it up. Uh, the drawback of using these resistive heated tips is you see about this U-shaped um, design, and they're quite more expensive and as well as they limit the other types of potential uh, functional characterization you can do with the AFM. But the idea is the same. So you can thermally desorb material from underneath the AFM tip. And just to show what that looks like, if you take um, just a standard compound like uh, printed yellow ink on photo paper, you can see a photo here um, in the right hand corner. Um, we can then take an optical image. You can see these little op uh, ink dots on the surface. And then what we can do is we can do this uh, multimodal imaging uh, using the AFM probe. You can see this is the topography of these dots and overlaid on top of the topography, uh, the color map is actually the chemical signature for this pigment yellow 74, which we're detecting by doing thermal desorption. And you can see there's a clear correlation between uh, the structural mounds that you see on the surface and the signature for pigment yellow 70, uh, 74. So we know that this approach works in terms of kind of a standard sample. And you, know, you can see that we don't, uh, even though we're using the AFM tip to scan across the surface, we're not actually pulling any material across. We don't have this cross-contamination effect that you might envision with some other techniques. Uh, and that's because the AFM tip is constantly heating. And the AFM, the temperature at the AFM tip, we can control uh, up to about 1,000 degrees C, really in a controllable manner for about up to 500 degrees. And so the tip is always hot. The material are never really sitting back down on the tip as you're scanning it across. And so it's also self-cleaning, which has a lot of um, opportunities in terms of carryover effect that you're not worried about, okay, are you taking material from one spot to the other? Um, we've applied this technique to really visualize really complicated samples. So the beauty of using AFM is you can actually look at things that are uh, wet and, 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 and in terms of biology, you know, you don't have to worry about complicated sample prep if you're thinking about doing other chemical imaging techniques that might require a vacuum environment like quality. So you can start thinking of visualizing these things in situ in a, in a real uh, growing fashion um, because you don't have to have a vacuum, you don't have to have a matrix deposition. And so here we were working with our bioenergy science folks uh, looking at a particular bacteria. This is GM17. It grows um, on roots, and it's, it's been thought to be one of the signaling bacteria that helps roots grow in terms of uh, plant productivity and absorb nutrients for uh, trees to grow. And here you can see this uh, GM17 bacteria. It's growing in an auger gel. And so what we could do is actually can take this auger gel directly and actually scan it with the AFM tip to get the morphology. And as you can see from the optical image, there's these little uh, dark spots in the bacteria, and you can see a closer zoom in optical image. There's these crystalline structures, and the biologists um, were actually very interested to see. You know, they 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 speculated and they kind of thought that these are phenazine crystals, but what they didn't know is so phenazine is a signaling molecule for for this particular bacteria. Is the phenazine uh, localized only to the crystal? or is there some signature of phenazine going outside the crystal structure? And this is of course important if you're thinking of this bacteria that is growing on the root, it's signaling. Uh, how is the signaling mechanism working um, in terms of this uh, plant microbe interaction? And so what we, could, what we were able to do is again, we were able to, of course, you can see the scales here are very different. This is hundred microns. When we're thinking about an AFM scan image, it's this, this whole entire image is only hundred microns on each side. And so we're, I think we're scanning only really able to, you know, catch one single crystal um, in an image. But what you can see here is the AFM topography uh, where we landed on a crystal. And you can see this kind of mountain range, this uh, region here uh, where there's a crystal and then where it's nice and smooth is the agar gel. And then what we're doing is we were, um, we're overlaying uh, the color map here is actually of the phenazine one carboxamide, which we're able to identify 
using um, liquid extra we did some liquid extraction mass specs so to target that this was the actual phenazine so then we did MSMS to target this particular compound and you can see that we have this uh, really nice clear uh, correlation between the structure of the crystal the phenazine crystals and the phenazine one carboxamide and what you can also see is we were able to show to the biologist that the phenazine is really localized only to the crystalline structure. There's almost no signal that's coming out into the agar gel. So it's very confined. So this helped them generate understanding in terms of what's happening in the signaling of these materials. Now, if you're using AFM, the you know topography is sort of a morpholo morphology imaging is sort of the more kind of the standard approach in terms of what you can do, but ASM can do so much more. So you're actually having a physical probe that is touching the surface. And the physical probe, these ASM tips have a tip diameter, you know, they can get as sharp um, as atomic resolution, you can get atomic, but in, in most standard cases, you know, the tip diameter is between 10 and 30 nanometers. So there you can get nanoscale physical characterization, such as you can get mechanical properties of, uh, of materials, you can get electrical. And of course, mechanical properties are important in biological systems and soft materials. And what can you, you know, how can you combine the data channels? So uh, here is some work that we did on working with a, a polymeric system. This is a phase separated polystyrene, poly two vinyl pyridine uh, polymer compound. And you can see that if you do ASM topography, you have these clear domains, uh, height contrast. Uh, but however, just looking at that, you don't know what exactly is going on. You just see that there's a morphological. If you do now use the AFM to get mechanical characterization, uh, we can get information in terms of the relative stiffness of the material and the energy dissipation and the relative stiffness you can use them to extract things like Young's modulus for the, um, uh, for the polymer. And you, you can see it's clearly within these morphological domains, we also have domains that are associated with uh, different stiffnesses, so different mechanical characterizations. And so the different mechanicals are most likely, uh, of course, driven by a chemical uh, differentiation. However, just looking at the mechanical, it's very hard to determine that. And so what we did is then we did the same type of experiment where we did first uh, ASM morphology followed by the ASM mechanical mapping. And then we went through and did our ASM mass spec uh, uh, thermal desorption. Uh, followed by secondary ionization, and what we now what we can see here is we can now uh, extract the ion for the monomer of P2VP, and you can see we have this nice chemical signatures within these uh, domains. But what you can see is there's actually a difference uh, between what we're seeing chemically and what we're seeing structurally. So if you look at the topography. Uh, before we do any kind of pyrolysis, you, you basically see these domains, but where the bubbles are highlighted, you don't really see anything. And you also don't see anything in the mechanical mapping. And that's because you have a, it's a different uh, voxel sizes that you're imaging. So when you're doing topography, you only have an X, Y. When you're doing a mechanical characterization, you're measuring the mechanical response of the material, but the, really what you're measuring is a certain depth to it, so which the depth is really the, the radius of the, of the cantilever. So you're only measuring materials at about 30 nanometer depth. However, when we're doing the mass spectrometry, um, thermal desorption, we're actually removing about 140 nanometers in this case. And of course, it's any material dependent of, of compounds. And what we're seeing is a chemical signature coming up here. And so what we did is when we combined the data from all the channels, the pre-pyrolysis uh, pre to, pre topography, the stiffness, the energy dissipation, the chemical analysis, and the uh, post-pyrolysis topography, uh, then we did some uh, data analytics, some simple machine learning uh, PCA analysis of the data. And then we were able to cluster on the PCA signal. And what we found is that we were able to actually, using this multimodal approach, we're actually able to find buried interfaces in this particular polymer of the P2VP that they before actually didn't know was happening in terms of the structural uh, separation that's only happening not um, in X and Y, but also in Z. And so what does the data look like? So if we're doing this kind of um, full scan mass spectra, um, here, here is the topography, and if we're uh, here, is, we're scanning the AFM tip in this direction. And if we extract uh, this uh, uh, poly two vinyl pyridine signal, this monomer, we can see the extracted ion chronogram here for M over Z one hundred and six. Then you can see it goes up with a change in morphology. If we ex if we extract the spectra here, we have the signal for M over Z one hundred and six. 
And just to confirm that what we're seeing is really the, the monomer, we did some uh, standard, uh, advanced standards. So this is the thermal desorption of a bulk, um, uh, basically a P2BP sample, not a phase separated one. And you can see, we can clearly see this nice uh, uh, two vinyl pyridine, the monomer. We can also see some of the dimers that form when you have standard thermal desorption. The nice thing about thermal desorption is thermal desorption has existed for a very long time in mass spectrometry since you know the early 1970s, and you have really nice um, uh, standard uh, characterization that, that you can you know what you can see in terms of spectra, especially if you're thinking about EI. Uh, here we're doing APCI, but uh, on top of it, you know you're going to get this is if you're the types of molecules that you can see, you can do single molecule intact thermal desorption for. You know, small molecules kind of under the 1,000 Daltons, or you can start thinking, you can start doing fingerprinting like pyrolysis like we're doing here, we're looking at the monomer. And then uh, just to confirm that what we're seeing here is monomer, we ran the monomer precursor, we did uh, a headspace sampling, you can see this M over Z106 coming out as well. Now, what does the system look like? So like I said, we're working here with uh, Oxford Instruments Asylum Research to commercialize this technology. So here is an Ox this is an Oxford instrument site for AFM, and you can see it in the here. It's uh, sitting right next to a, a thermo orbi trap, and you can see the size and scale difference. Um, in general, these two things you very rarely see in the same lab. An AFM, you want it usually sits um, in a very quiet, isolated area to get the best um, spatial resolution. And mass spectrometers, of course, have pumps and vibrate and are very loud, and so we've been able to really develop something that allows us to couple the two together to minimize on the vibration isolation of the two systems. So how does our uh, photothermal system work? And so you can see here, we have um, a picture of a standard AFM tip. And over here is you have um, the laser diode signal for how you detect um, the motion of the cantilever to get your uh, physical characterization. But at the back here is what you see is the blue laser spot and it's, the excitation is at 405 nanometers. And this laser is present in the AFMs for um, asylum research. And they use this to do, um, basically they can drive this, if they drive it at the back, they can actually do excitation of the cantilever for tapping mode versus the piezo. However, what we worked with them on is instead of having the laser shine here to do, um, basically excitation of the vibrational motion of the cantilever, we've now shifted the position of the laser uh, to illuminate the tip and we've increased the laser power from about a 10 milliwatt laser to a 30 milliwatt laser to allow us to uh, actually locally heat. So the blue laser is absorbed in the coating of the AFM cantilever. We have a platinum silicide coating on these cantilevers. The AFM heats up uh, locally, the, the cantilever heats up and the heat is transferred down to the tip and we're able to absorb the material. Um, so how do we collect the material so to create a nice system? Because we're having, well, we're trying to sample very small volumes. As, you can, as, as I mentioned, the area under a tip is about 30 nanometers. And so we're trying to collect materials, you know, from uh, sampling areas of, I think we've shown with this system about 200 nanometers volume up to maybe a couple of, maybe one or two microns, depending on how long we sit. And so extracting and collecting all the material is extremely uh, critical part of the steps. So we, de we developed, uh, we took inspiration actually from, um, I worked some with laser ablation ICPMS and they have these nice closed uh, cell volumes to, you know, to really collect everything and flows to carry everything from the side of the desorption to the ionization. Because at, just like in laser ablation ICPMS, we actually have a separate desorption step and a separate ionization step. So we're thermally desorbing the material um, in the cell, and then we're transporting it with a transport gas that's here is uh, nitrogen, but we've actually now shown that we can change the gas uh, to shift the ionization. We can add more moisture um, by, by flowing um, uh, humid air, or we can actually you know, flow things like toluene to shift the ionization processes or some other uh, nonpolar type molecules. And then, of course, we extract the material and down this extraction tube to the mass spectrometer. And so under here, what does this actually look like in, in practice? So we have, like I said, we have a closed cell design and you have this uh, chip of the cantilever here. And here's the extraction cap of the mass spectrometer. You can see, again, the, the difference in scales. Um, so the ASM tip is at the edge here and it sits about um, something like on the order of half a nanometer. Uh, apart from the extraction capillary. 
half an animate half an anime and the way we control it is we have uh so it always when you open it up and it locks in the same place we've designed the design the capillary to sit directly in the folder and lock in. And so even if you change your sample or change your tip, you're always going back to the same position. And so like I said, you're always optimizing for the extraction efficiency. And so now we can you know, heat up our, our ASM cantilever, we can thermally desorb under the tip, and we can now have the cell continuously purging so we don't have any material sitting back down on the surface or being trapped so for, for um, analysis in another area. So what does the interface actually look like in practice? And so over here you have the AFM and here's this closed cell that we've designed. You see this is the gas lines that are going in. This is the extraction capillary to the mass spectrometer. We then have an ionization region here. This is a basically a cross design. So we have a collisions of, we have our ion ionization happening uh, using um, atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. And so what we're doing is basically we're having a reaction ion cas uh, cascade. So we have an APCI needle during a corona discharge, uh, two kilovolts. Um, we are then ionizing the ambient air. And so we have this, this is the reaction molecule cascade. And we have our, our uh, neutrals flowing over here. We have a, a, this uh, reaction zone over here. And sorry, and basically then they're going to the mass spectrometer this way through detection. We've worked with Thermo Fisher to basically modify their inlet capillary. This is the standard inlet capillary that you see if you use Thermo systems. And we've designed it to directly couple to this ionization region and to make sure that everything is being collected um, from the time that we're firing the laser, we work directly with the triggering, op uh, triggering electronics of the ion trap to uh, basically have the exact delay from the triggering of the laser to the time it takes the molecules to travel through this um, uh, from the neutrals to the ionization to inside the mass spectrometer. And there's kind of a, um, a couple of milliseconds delay from the time that you fire each laser to when it arrives at the, at, at the side of the trap, of the linear, of the linear trap. So uh, what can we do with this system? Um, so here is again, kind of the same yellow ink and just showing the reproducibility using this photothermal approach. Uh, you can now see that here is um, just the topography of, of the ink. We can go through and do an array of sampling. Here is the, and the nice thing is because we're using the AFM, we now have the AFM, we can go back and characterize the surface. We have this nice topography. And so you can see these 400 nanometer sampling spots. And now at each individual sampling spot, we can extract the full scan mass spectra. Uh, because we're now using an Orbitrap system, uh, we have accurate mass identification, so we don't even need to, we're not doing MSMS, we're just doing full scan. And so you can see the firings for this pigment yellow 74, and you can see this protonated species here in the full scan uh, quite clearly. Um, we worked to apply this to a different, different class of molecules. So for instance, some um, pharmaceutical compounds, this is a common over-the-counter and um, uh, headache medicine, which combines uh, paracetamol, caffeine, and aspirin, it's called Excedrin in the United States. Uh, but the idea is, um, so you have different um, distributions within the pill. So we have uh, a nice, you know, shape, you know, uh, smooth surface of the pill that we've taken and polished. And now we can go through and do spot sampling analysis, and we can clearly uh, visualize all three of the main uh, constituents in the in the uh, formulation: uh, aspirin paracetamol and caffeine, you can see the, uh, in here, there are the protonated, of course, because we're doing APCI uh, with the aspirin, we'll, we lose this functional group. So the nice thing about using these particular AFM tips is because they're basically standard uh, silicon nitride cantilevers that are now coated with these platinum silicide coating. So it's very easy to do any kind of standard AFM uh, characterization, including mechanical characterization. And so this is work um, that we're looking at. This is a, um, I'm drinking my coffee now. I'm a big fan of coffee and so are the folks at Asylum. And so one of the interesting things is um, uh, coffee bags are actually made from a multi-component poly polymeric system. And so you have both different layers of polymers as well as metallic compounds. And there's a lot of interest in terms of now with our uh, problems in polymers in terms of polymer upcycling and how to take these multi-component polymer system and separate it out into their individual uh, species and then uh, decompose the polymers into uh, usable compounds. But in order to do that, you really have to uh, get at the interfaces of these polymers uh, and polymer metallic surfaces. 
And here is the mechanical map and the, the color scale here is basically the grade from black to white is showing the different uh, response, um, mechanical response of the material. So you know right here, there's a clear interface between this lighter and darker material, the two polymers, and they're separated out by this metallic layer. So now we can go through and we can do spot sampling from the two different materials. We can, uh, you can see where the samplings have been occurred. This is post sampling and here's the height. If you were just doing a morphology characterization of height, you would never see this change in mechanical properties. So then we can subtract the average vector from the two areas and we can start pulling out um, not only the different um, polymers, these species, but also all of the additives they add in polymers. And so we can see the phthalates, the plasticizers, anti-static agents. And what's interesting is we even see um, <laughs> because we're scanning the surface of the materials, we actually see polysiloxane. Um, and polysiloxane is ubiquitous if you're ever in ambient or if you're using ASM tips because ASM tips are always stored in gel packed boxes. So the polysiloxane actually uh, creeps onto the ASM cantilever. So when you sit down, you actually also uh, are putting polysiloxane on the surface. So something to look out for. And you can also see things like plasticizers. And of course, so if you're thinking of this uh, polymer upcycling, as you're thinking of how to target these interfaces, understanding not only what is the polymer that's in there, but also the additives and the stuff is really important in terms of targeting um, for uh, depolymerization. So, you know, the polymers and biological systems are one uh, aspect that you might want to, why you'd want to look at things in ambient, but some another systems are to look at is that are difficult to do in a vacuum environment are actually non-conductive materials or things that are really charged up in a vacuum environment if you look at them and things with a curved nature uh, surface um, because your A hits it's harder to scan um, if you're using let's say an IM beam or laser-based technology and also because uh, they charge up much more when you have a spherical nature and so one of the our partners that we've been evaluating this was Procter and Gamble and you would be amazed at how much money P&G invests in their products. And one of the products of their main line is Pantene shampoo and conditioner. And they really want to understand um, where the shampoo and conditioner is going in terms of the hair structure and how it's affecting. These are the cuticles. And chemically, is it actually penetrating into the hair? Is it sitting? Where is it targeting? So what we can do is we can now use the AFM because again, we're not worried about the sur surface structure. If it's conductive, non-conductive, we don't have to apply any matrix. We can clearly see the structure of the hair. And here are the cuticles. We can go in and do thermal desorption um, of the hair. You can see these little holes that we've scanned here. The line profile will hold there about one micron. And you can see here the optical image. Here's the hair laying underneath the AFM cantilevers. And you can see where we haven't sampled. Here's where we have sampled. We can now take this data. And here is, we have this topography. We have the, the, the curved surface. We have this. Um, uh, structure on top of this cuticle structure. And then we have all of our thermal desorption events across this uh, 25 micron area. And here's the average uh, mass spectra because we're doing, we're working with PNG. Like I said, we're interested in our shampoos and conditioners and we know all of the active ingredients that we ran independently. And we can actually start pulling out um, both, um, here's the, 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 different, the different fatty acids, cholesterol and different additives that they have in both of their shampoos and conditioners. Uh, because again, we're using the Orbi traps, so we have accurate mass identification. And that's what's nice about this is because we have this full scan mass spectra, we can now overlay the different chemical signatures on top of the physical structure. And you can see that the things that correspond to things from the conditioner uh, here are actually building up right where they would want them to build up at the cuticle edge to make your hair nice and smooth and not frizzy. And of course, you can see we can identify things as shampoo ingredients, as conditioner, and some of the shampoo uh, things like this uh, coca uh, amido that propyl. But I mean, it's actually more evenly distributed as they would expect because you're washing the hair. And however, things that are more uh, conditioner con ingredients, which they expect to target specific areas at this cuticle interface, are actually building up where they expect them to. And we can also see the endogenous things from the hair, so where the cuticle is popping up. Uh, we can actually see the cholesterol signal coming out of from inside the hair. Um, we can also look at complicated systems, um, which are basically adhesives. Adhesives are, they have all sorts of volatile compounds, VOCs in them, um, which are making them extremely difficult to analyze in a vacuum environment because they're all going to leave the surface. They're also squishy. 
And however, we can go through and do the same kind of analysis. It's the post-it note. Um, this is work some, that we did with 3M. And what we can do is we can uh, go through, get a topography, and this is that rough surface overlay on the topography. We now can do a mechanical map, and you can see there's different mechanical maps corresponding to the domains. Um, they're very interested in basically a, uh, defects in these uh, adhesives and kind of uh, what are the chemical additives and the defects. And so what we can do is we can do again this kind of thermal desorption um, across the surface. And you can see here, this is a 10 micron by 10 micron scan. And what we can do now is we can, um, this is the average mass spectra, and we can correlate um, different additives that they're putting in here uh, with the mechanical uh, characterization. The, the, um, the color is the chemistry and the uh, outline is the mechanical maps. And you can see uh, there's clear localization of some particular chemicals with different changes in, the, in, in uh, mechanical properties. So some materials I showed you, you know, you can go through and sample directly, but uh, some materials, their they're, uh, thermal desorption, their melting uh, temperature, and they're is very close to their desorption. So what you're going to do is you're going to actually melt the material. It's going to go under undergo a solid uh, to liquid phase transition before it sublimates into a gas. And so it's very hard to sample directly um, on the surface. And so one of the ways you can get around that is you can actually, instead of sampling directly on the surface, we've developed what we call a scratch and sniff approach, which allows us to go through, this is a standard approach where we just go and we sample, as I showed you before, remove the material. We can use the ASM tip to scan across a controlled area. We then collect material on the ASM tip, and then we can thermally desorb the tip once it's off the surface um, into, the, into the system A. Now you have a controlled volume where everything is on the tip, and so you have a higher desorption efficiency, so you're not sending a bunch of energy into this uh, melt transition, and we're having da less damage onto the surface, so we can control the size of the sampling. So where is this important? Um, so this is a um, basically a, a paraffin wax, which has additives, um, it has UV stabilizer avobenzone, it's actually um, chapstick, and so as some of you know, the UV stabilizer and chapstick kind of, um, you know, this basically it oxidizes over time and so you want to look in terms of where it's, where it's going in, in the wax and uh, is there any kind of um, oxidation happening of the molecule and so what we did is we basically we saw that by applying um, by controlling the force that we apply on the cantilever we can control how much material we pick up on the cantilever so basically we can scan the cantilever and we can pick up material from the surface in a controlled manner and then we can absorb it and now we can do the same thing. We can go through this as this paraffin wax. We can scan uh, the surface area here. You can see um, we can do, we, we have a LOD of about 250 nanometers, but like 250 nanometers, which comes out to about eight, eight atomoles of material um, uh, of, um, of the avobenzone. And then we can remove it. This is while we're scanning and this is post scanning. We can see where we remove the material. Um, and we can have these nice reproducible um, replicates. Uh, this is 500 by 500 nanometers areas. You can see here the free sampling. Uh, here is the MSMS of the avobenzone that we were seeing, that we know that we're actually looking for avo avobenzone. So it's one of these, uh, the two main uh, MSMS fragments. And here is again, uh, just to make sure that we're, um, a sanity check that this is actually what we're seeing is um, doing some headspace sampling. We can do this on more complicated materials. So again, uh, avobenzone is not the only one that's, um, so uh, tissue, uh, animal tissue, human tissue are also that have the same problem. When you're trying to thermally desorb them, you're, you're, you're putting a lot of energy into that goes into a melt transition before you actually undergo a thermal desorption. So we can do the same thing. This is a kidney tissue. This is work in collaboration with Ron Heron at Maastricht. And we can go through and we can uh, uh, get AFM topography, we can then, remove material here. This is a one micron size box from the tissue. Um, here as we scanned it, and then we can re, uh, do thermal desorption and we can see uh, all the lipids that are coming out of the tissue here from a, spe a specific sampling area. The other way we have worked on uh, controlling the sampling volume and minimizing this uh, thermal melt versus uh, thermal desorption is by really controlling the uh, flow of heat into the cantilever and into the from the cantilever and under the tip surface junction into the surface is basically uh, the slower that you transfer the material, the more melting you get, which makes sense. It's like frying an egg. 
So what you really want to do is you want to have very short pulses going in, heating pulses going into the system. Uh, very similar to laser ablation, you want to have very shorter pulses to maintain uh, kind of a tight focus as well as intact molecular um, desorption. And so by uh, working and improving on the heating functions here, so the blue is the pulsing that we apply to the cantilever and the red is actually kind of the heat profile of the cantilever. Um, we came up and we can actually, this is just standard thermal desorption, we can go from like a micron or a couple of micron thermal desorption point here to basically if we apply a very, very uh, uh, hot short pulse followed by holding it at a slightly shorter uh, volt, uh, a much lower voltage for a short period of time, we can now shrink the scale of this desorption spot by 200 to, to 200 nanometers while maintaining the same exact uh, mass spec signal intensity. Now, um, there's, like I said, so that's the kind of the work we've done in terms of developing um, this AFM mass spec technology at Ambient. But we've also worked a lot um, in combining uh, atomic force microscopy also with uh, time of flight secondary mass spectrometry. Um, in time of flight secondary mass spectrometry, of course, operates in a vacuum environment. But because you're using a focused ion beam, you now have opportunity to do both elemental and molecular um, analysis. But however, the ion beam, of course, operates in a vacuum environment, but because of that, you can do depth profiling, but you have more of a fragmented nature for your chemical analysis. So you don't have this intact molecular characterization like I showed you with an Orbi trap, but there's still unique opportunities when you're using these two uh, technologies together. And so one of the work that we did is um, we worked with a, a chemical company called Syngenta, and they make um, agrochemical products. And one of the things they make is they make coatings for core, uh, for seeds. And the coatings are these polymer-based uh, materials. And inside the coatings, there's all the herbicides and pesticides. And what they really wanted to do is they basically want to have a, a coating that doesn't break up on, and produce this uh, byproduct of all these pesticides that would go into the groundwater. But they also don't want the coating to be too sticky, so this is seed to uh, seeds stick together and they can't go down the hoppers and be transported. And so they really wanted to link the local physical properties of kind of adhesion of these coatings with local chemical properties to really optimize through this chemical engineering of the chemical species. And working with atomic force microscopy, um, we were able this is, uh, to characterize and do adhesion maps of these polymeric coatings. And you can see there's domains with high adhesion and low adhesion, we can do force, vol uh, force volume mapping. And if we go across three different coatings that they provided us um, in terms of uh, decreasing in flowability, so how well they flow down the hopper, how, how much they stick to each other, we can see we have a difference in terms of, uh, you have one where you have, you know, kind of these domains and one where you have less domains. And so how we wanted to understand what is driving this adhesion domain formation in these materials. And so we were used our time of flight secondary and mass spectrometer uh, on the coating because the spectra are actually complicated because again, you're not producing intact species and there's a ton of stuff added into these coatings. We actually did some machine learning and we did some principal component analysis and some clustering. And so what we were able to find is that we actually have uh, three types of regions in these materials. We have the active components that they add into these materials, some oxygen rich component, and then a hydrocarbon rich component, which is the polymer species. If we overlay the three components of the coatings, you can see the distribution of them. But what's more interesting is then when we do a correlative analysis between the AFM uh, data and the chemical analysis is we clearly see a correlation of the domain structure, which corresponds to the oxygen rich component um, in, these, in these polymers. And you can see here is the long needle like structure that you see in the adhesion and correlating to the oxygen rich component, whereas there are these smaller domains and larger domains here. Um, and so basically what we're able to do is to show that by using correlative analysis, we can really see and understand the structure function relationship and be able to really help uh, guide this material design. Uh, however, as I sh showed to you, TopSims has great spatial resolution. However, the spectral resolution on it, of course, you have this fragmented nature. You don't see intact molecular species. So what you really want is a technique that's going to give you intact molecular species, but also the high spatial resolution of top sims. So 
how can we do that? And so here we've worked on developing a machine learning workflow that would allow us to, instead of physically designing a new system that can sample materials with high spatial and high spectral resolution, can we use data from the two to learn a physical relationship between the, uh, the data channels? Because we're sampling the same tissue, there's understanding that there's same material in there. And so there's a physical relationship between the spectra that you see in the top sims and the spectra you see in the MALDI. Um, we're going to basically, this is the mouse brain, we can uh, create a co-registration algorithm that we put in some uh, fiducial markers that allows us to register the two systems together. We can take first top sim data, then we can apply a matrix and do MALDI. Um, and you can see the, you can see the two uh, data sets on the mouse brain. We can then, uh, what we can do is then take basically top SIMS data, we can take MALDI data, and we can use uh, deep learning to basically create a relationship between the voxels and uh, the data in the two systems. And to create this idea that we can now have this perfectly aligned stereo section that we can do things in a volume, so build brain atlases potentially. And so what we can do is we can take the high spatial resolution of the top sims, but the low spectral resolution and uh, learn the relationship between the lower spatial and the higher spectral resolution of the MALDI um, on a point by point basis. Now this of course is gonna generate for us a large training data, data set. And so we can do the cross correlation analysis. And what that gives us is basically we can have this learned approach uh, between the two data sets. And then we can now generate a predicted data set from uh, learning from the two uh, systems that's now going to have the spatial resolution of the top sims and the spectral resolution of the MALDI. Uh, and then we can generate predicted MSI images both at high spectral and high spatial resolution. So what does this look like in principle? If you were gonna do MALDI, um, this is the raw data and look for cholesterol. You can see this uh, 369 molecule, however, top sims, Cholesterol is kind of fragile, it actually fragments it and you only see the head group, which is this 95. However, by learning the relationship, we were able to actually do have a predicted spectra. Um, this is the reconstructed cholesterol. Now it's 369. This is actually going at the MALDI uh, spectral signal, but at the spatial resolution of the top sims. And I should point out, this is not data fusion. This is not just you know in painting of the pixels. This is actually le learning the physical relationship between the spectral signals. And because we're learning the spectral resolution, uh, spectral uh, relationship between all the signals, we can actually reconstruct the full entire spectra, not individual uh, uh, molecules. And so this is showing the raw uh, MALDI top data uh, of an area of the brain. This is um, just extracting some lipids here. And then we can take an area over here and have the full scan mass spectrum. And now of course we can take the exact same peaks and now reconstruct them. In, in our reconstructed data set and our predicted data set. And now you can see how much sharper those features are. Um, however, if we just zoom in into an area where the same area of the two, you can see we have extremely great agreement between uh, the predicted and the raw data. And the last uh, kind of approach um, that I'll talk about before I'll conclude is what, what is another way to improve spatial resolution? Like I said, Okay, you know, MALDI and topsins, we can combine them and do a predictive data set uh, to get us down into the subcellular 100 nanometer regime. But what if we want to go even further and still get this correlated imaging? We're working with uh, Zeiss microscopy um, and LIST in Luxembourg to develop a helium ion SIMS system approach where we can use the helium ion microscope both for imaging and then use the helium on the neon beam to do some analysis. So now we can do the same thing. We can do imaging, we can do depth profiling, and now we can overlay uh, the SIM signal on top of the secondary ion electron signal. And what's the benefit of doing something like that? Well, because we're using a highly focused um, noble gas ion beam, we can now focus the beam for imaging uh, down to a couple, like one or two nano, actually sub nanometer if you're using the helium, if you're using the neon, a couple of nanometers. And now we can get chemical imaging information at uh, about 14 nanometer spatial resolution. You can see this is a, um, a, a standard grid sample where with the aluminum gallium um, lines, and we can clearly still separate out the 13 nanometer peak here. And we can do depth profiling of electrodes. We can see this elemental signal for uh, silicon, titanium, and gold as we dig through um, the electrode. We can also, we see that our um, 
isotopic ratios for titanium and uh, is uh, what you would expect from the predicted values. And we also, because, you know, yes, the beam is, is, is highly energetic, so it's going to fragment, but we still see some organic molecules. And here is a signature for um, if you have um, siloxane, actually, um, this, and then you, here, you, can see, you can see there are intact siloxane agents and some hydrocarbon fragments. And so we can actually use what we wanted to show is that, you know, we can actually use this system uh, for soft materials. And this is work um, that with ExxonMobil to understand whether or not we can do quantitative analysis of um, separation of polypropylene and polyethylene. And you can see uh, the comparison of Tofsims and Hymsims. Tofsims is the, is the standard approach for doing analysis of these types of materials. And you can clearly see that um, we have, of course, the difference in the spectrum because, um, of course, the HIM is much more energetic, so it's much more favorable to the lower mass uh, fragments versus the HIM sim, the, uh, the top sim sees much large, much larger materials. However, you can still see this relationship, this uh, fragmentation pattern it still persists, so we are able to uh, separate out and quantify the polyethylene and polypropylene. And here's just the comparison by using the HIMSIMS, which we now have this uh, uh, visualization of secondary uh, electrons. We can take an image um, of, this, of these polymers, uh, these mixed polymer series. You can see that there's clear differences um, in the surface structure. We can go through and do uh, HIMSIMS analysis and we can extract the different polymeric fragments and then we can overlay it with what you can see down below. And just for comparison, why are we interested in it? You can see the difference in the spatial resolution and the scale bar. So you can see much more features that are coming up when we're doing this type of approach. We can also do depth profiling because we're removing materials and we can, again, look for things such as buried interfaces and at the same time monitor how we're removing this material. And we can even do quantitative analysis on these polyolefins. Uh, because we're looking at the specific ratios of these fragments, we can now clearly separate out the polypropylene from the polyethylene, both in the top sims, as well as simultaneously we can separate it out in the hem sims. So with that, um, I'll finish and leave it for questions. And of course, this, um, this work has been done over many years and uh, by multiple people in my team have contributed that have now uh, moved on to brighter pastures. Um, some have stayed at Oak Ridge and became staff. So Matthias now is at Perk and Elmer. Uh, Nick is at Siemens. Um, Allison is a raising a family. And so she's hoping to come back and work for me soon uh, once her kids are a little bit older. And then Anton is a staff. And of course, it wouldn't be possible without all our collaborators and our sponsors. And so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olga. Uh, I really appreciated your talk and presentation. Um, uh, to have a more controlled version of discussion, you can either raise an electronic hand or you place your question in the chat. And I see there is already one question from Arina. Thank you very much for the great talk and insights into AFM and in its liaison with mass spec, Olga. Can one estimate the sensitivity of the mass spec, for example, how many molecules need to be detected to have good signal to identify the molecule type? I think that's an excellent question. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that's going to depend on two things. Uh, well, A, it's going to depend on the ionization efficiency of the molecule. So you can't just give a number, uh, a blanket number it depends on two things, on the desorption efficiency of the molecule and the ionization efficiency of the molecule in the mass spectrometer. For something that's uh, very robust to heat, it, it, it thermally desorbs very easily, it stays intact, and it has, it has a very high ionization efficiency like avobenzone. It kind of showed that we can go down to eight atomoles sensitivity for material. Uh, we, had, we have similar numbers for something like caffeine, again, a very robust molecule. If you start thinking of more labile molecules, things that are going to break up, of course, that number is going to shift. And therefore, you're always going to have to do, uh, uh, do a calibration curve potential. If you want to do quantitative analysis, uh, it's going to be compound dependent. And you're going to have to do a calibration curve, uh, as I showed you, that we did for avobenzone. And the other thing is that it's going to depend on is not only your molecule and ionization efficiency, but also the matrix. 
So how easy is it to remove the material from the surface? Thanks a lot, Olga. Thank you, Martina. Of course, if there would be another question, somebody. If not, of course, I have a follow-up question, Olga. Um, you are presenting at the moment, and for me as a mass spec person, I understand it. You are mostly presenting data on rather small molecules and even large lipids are, for me, uh, in the smaller molecule area. What is your perspective, especially for the AFM mass spec approach? The thermal expansion leaves many molecules maybe intact. What is your perspective of targeting maybe some larger molecules like small peptides, multiply charged, singly charged? Yeah. So that's a great question. So one of the reasons, and I alluded to it a little bit, is we're using these fast heating pulses is uh, to limit the flow of heat in the surface. And heat is really what breaks up these fragile protein molecules, right? It's like frying an egg. Um, if we can inject heat at much faster rates, so something approaching that of laser uh, heat, you know, so laser heat transfer rates. So in the, we are hoping that we can get larger intact molecules off the surface. And so we're working to actually show that and the, in, with the electronics in terms of pulsing the heat from the laser into the tip and the tip transfer to get things intact. Um, the other, uh, question is right now, our system is uh, set up with a singly charged um, ionization source of APCI. However, we have, I have in the past built uh, sources that you can use an ESI source and we haven't been using them because most of the things we've been working with small molecules, there's no need for multiply charged. But as we work to develop this rapid uh, heating to try to get larger species into the gas phase intact, uh, then we can think about uh, adding ESI to do multiple charging. Thank you. Did some other question come up in the audience? Otherwise, I have a lot of questions for Olga. <laughs> okay, maybe let me dip into uh, something a little bit different. I do not know. So the thermal expansion concept is, uh, as you presented for AFM, is also combined, combined with optical microscopy. Maybe you are familiar with something that is called scanning near field optical microscopy. Do you know that Olga, maybe? I, I have heard, yes, I have heard of that technique. I have not used yeah. it myself. Okay, because that would be interesting for me because you have the very same concept of heating the tip. You have thermal expansion, then you have infrared uh, and optical microscopy that for me would be a super combination with mass spec, then you can really break the limits of optical diffraction. So you yeah. did not get into that area yet. Yeah, so the, you know, the one that we, I have technique I have used that goes off of uh, local thermal expansion is um, a, an approach that's called a nano IR. And so we have, um, I've worked with a company called Amasis that's now part of Bruker, where they basically, they shine the material with a IR laser. It then the material has mechanical expansion and you use the AFM to probe that mechanical expansion. And then you can get both, um, then you take the Fourier trans from the cantilever and you get the FTIR like signal from each point. Uh, we have done, and it wasn't me, it was uh, uh, the group that I worked with, uh, Gary Van Berkel's group before he retired, they did some work where they combined um, AFM nano IR with mass spec. So basically you can use that cantilever, thin cantilever that you're using to get the therm, basically the nano IR signal and then go through and then use a heating, they use the U-shaped resistive cantilevers to then thermally desorb and heat the material and cross-correlate the two signals. Yeah, thank you. Roger. If yes, you thank you. Um, sorry, I, I'm on my phone. I couldn't figure out how to type in my question. Um, so you mentioned that these different chemical compounds have different ionization efficiencies and desorption efficiencies and, and so on. If you look at these mass spectra, they're complicated. So can you comment on how, if you have a multi-component system, 
how you tease out which components are in these spectra uh, as you look at these really complicated, um, you know, it's so, a bunch of spikes everywhere. So, so it depends on what you're looking for. If, um, if you're doing a, a targeted analysis, you know the chemical composition of your molecule. And if you're on something like an Orbi trap system, you have an accurate mass analysis. You can also target, if you're having on a trap-based system, you can also target your molecules and do um, uh, basically fragmentation, uh, collision-induced association, where you're looking at the fragmentation uh, patterns of the molecules. If you're doing a discovery mode approach um, and you don't know what you're looking for, of course, that's always very complicated because you're looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, however, this is where some of the machine learning approaches that I showed could be very valuable which allow you to take a complicated spectra and then really um, do a data reduction approach and seeing what peaks are approved, uh, appearing locally together in different areas. And based on those components, seeing if you have understanding the relationship of the peaks that are coming out in those particular areas. Okay, more questions? Okay, is on mute again, so I guess his question was answered. I, I think so. I, I guess in, in the discovery mode, I mean, how, how practical is it? How, how difficult is that? Can you, can I give you any sample that, you know, just is mysterious and you'll be able to eventually tell me what it is or is, uh, what, what do you think the practical limits are? I think, are I that? think that's a, I mean, that's an analytical mass spectrometry question, right? That's um, one of the reasons that the mass spectrometers are getting higher and higher in uh, spectral resolution to be able to do this kind of identification where you can look at any peak and you have enough uh, decimal points after that you can start using uh, databases to predict um, a structure from the particular mass peak. And based on the structure, you can then start, with, you know, you, you have the chemical structure. You can start knowing what the unknowns are um, in the system. So in, 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 the same, in the same way that you would do NMR. Okay, thanks. Olga, I have one question. You mentioned that your AFM is set, sitting in a quiet area. As we know that mass spectrometry usually has turbo pumps and you're using an orbit trap, which also has a lot of turbo pumps because of the vacuum. And AFM is super sensitive for that very low or small frequency yeah. shifts. Uh, how did you overcome that? Is your stage somehow balanced or? So this is where the, um, the Cypher AFM uh, has really been great. Um, it's a very low noise system. So first of all, you saw that encasing, right? That we have around it that minimizes. Um, and so we only, we had created a panel on the side that allowed the tube to go through. So minimize on the, um, if you, you know, the mass specs is also allowed to minimize on coming in from kind of the noise from the system. Uh, the system itself also sits on a, uh, on, a on an active uh, passive kind of uh, damping system. So an active, uh, actively passive, you know, if they're, for the vibrations that are coupling from the mass spectrometer, we actually have an active uh, dampening stage to dampen those vibrations. But in general, the, the cipher is built in a way that it really minimizes on the vibrations. Um, and that's why it can be, even when it sits, if you just don't have it, you can just put the, the Cypher AFM not coupled in a really noisy environment and you're going to have a very low noise system. And that's really from the engineering of the way the Cypher AFM has been designed. But then of course, we also have, to have some dampening, um, active dampening stages. Okay, now I understand that because I was always surprised how clear your AFM topography is right beside a mass spec with those problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Any more questions? Yeah, please go ahead, Arina. Thank you very much, Martina. So, Olga, I was wondering um, from the chemical perspective side, if having this heating on the surface um, are there any applications out there that, for example, through the heating, one can 
let's say, induce a chemical reaction on this spot on the surface and maybe create some, I don't know, some catalytic spot and then see maybe some reactions going on in this region, which you, on the other hand, can measure with the mass spec. I'm, I'm just thinking about this application from yeah. as a chemist. Um, yeah. yeah, no, that's a great question. That's something we actually thought about. Um, so when I was talking about the uh, the flow cell and changing of the gases, that's actually one of the uh, applications is for reactive gases. So just like you said, you have a local heating, you have a reactive gas on the catalytic surface that's going to cause a chemical reaction and you want look for the chemical species. Mm -hmm. So we've absolutely looked, uh, thought of that. I, have, I don't have any data to show for that. We haven't run that experiment in particular, but that's absolutely something that we've thought about as an application for the approach. That's great. I can imagine that it will be very interesting for the community to, to have these tools. Thank you. I'm muted. Any further questions? So if this is not the case, one digital applause again for you, Olga. Thank you for that super ex for mass spectrometrists it's super exciting honestly uh, i think for the rest of the community you introduced some new aspects of spatial resolution and spatial information and we thank you all very much for your presentation thank you very much everybody i 